So all set? Yes, sir. We can start. Just give me a minute, please. Good evening everybody, welcome to this evening episode of Pursue and this is Pursue 12H which is respiratory system and we are streaming live from North Bengal Medical College via Kolkata and we have a very relevant topic today which is infective and inflammatory lesions of the lung and to talk on that we have Dr. Indranil Chakravarti who is an MD pathology, a DHM, MAMS, FIAC an associate professor of pathology at North Bengal Medical College West Bengal. Dr. Indranil Chakravarti had graduated from NRS Medical College, Kolkata with distinction and honors. After completing his MD in pathology in the year 2008, he has done his ISC fellowship from Ames, New Delhi and a diploma in hospital management from NIH FW, New Delhi in 2014. He has been honored with fellowship from International Academy of Cytology and is the Indian Ambassador of European Association of Cancer Research and United States and Canadian Academy of Pathology. He is presently uh, working as an associate professor in North Bengal Medical College. He has been as an invited speaker in various national and international conferences with multiple international and national presentations and publications. Before I ask Dr. Chakravarti to take over, let me request all of you to please keep your mic muted, your camera off and please don't share your screen. With this, let me request Dr. Chakravarti, sir, please share your screen and let us start. Thank you so much, sir. Good evening, everybody, all the listeners, and especially Nadim, sir. And thank you for uh, having me for another session. So, uh, probably today is uh, the last class uh, about the non neoplastic lung pathology. Yeah, sir, uh, can you see the screen? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, since today is the last class of non-neoplastic lung pathology, uh, probably uh, some of the slides are repetitions of already, uh, that has already been covered. But please bear with me. So, before starting, uh, let's revise what are the common types. Uh, okay, I should minimize this now. So, what are the common types of lung biopsies that we encounter? So, previously the open lung biopsy by thoracotomy was used, but uh, it is not much used nowadays. Nowadays, what we have are the endoscopic biopsies uh, by the flexible fiber optic bronchoscope. They are either endobronchial or transbronchial biopsies. And we have transthoracic or percutaneous biopsies. For example, we do the FNAC or the CNB, CT guided or US guided. Those are included in the transthoracic uh, biopsies. And we also have the video assisted thoracoscopic surgery or VATS lung biopsy, which uh, help us to get much bigger amount of tissue. So the selection of the biopsy method employed is dictated by the clinical circumstances, the infrastructure and the level of experience and skill of the thoracic surgeon, the pulmonologist or the interventional radiologist. Now coming on to the endoscopic biopsies, they are uh, good for localized endobronchial lesions, but they are not good for peripheral lung processes or as in uh, diffuse or in any diffuse processes like interstitial lung diseases. Transbronchial biopsies can be done in diffuse lung diseases with peribronchial distributions, for example in sarcoidosis, but they are quite good for the diagnosis of opportunistic infections, including pneumocystic spheroetsy, uh, the fungal and the various viral infections. And they are also good for lung transplants. They are good for uh, squamous cell carcinoma, carcinoid, small cell carcinoma, or salivary gland tumors, which involve the bronchial tree. And uh, they also fare quite uh, okay for the connective tissue diseases. Now, the transthoracic biopsies are mainly indicated for the peripheral lung lesions. Uh, but they are good for the peripheral pulmonary nodules, for, for example, the 
adenocarcinomas they are located more peripherally for that the transthoracic uh, route is uh, preferred uh, and again patients with suspected lung infection where other techniques have failed we can go for transthoracic biopsy or for any pleural thickening where we are suspecting a malignancy we can do transthoracic biopsy now vats or video assisted uh, thoracoscopic surgery is a very good option it is done under general anesthesia by this method we can get multiple relatively large tissues and we can also do wedge resection or lobectomy so in this a 2 cm incision is done in the 6 7th intercostal space and a thoracoscope is introduced along the mid clavicular line and two additional 2 cm incisions anterior and posterior in the 5th intercostal space are done and this uh, type of biopsy they are very good for ilds that interstitial lung diseases and connective tissue diseases and peripheral tumors so uh, this uh, vats may not be available in all the places because of uh, infrastructural limitations but <clears throat> there is one novel bronchoscopic technique that is the blc bronchoscopic lung cryobiopsy this is very good technique uh, this involves a bronchoscopic placement of a flexible cryoprobe inside the lung parenchyma and then the probe is frozen and the shearing out of lung tissue of this frozen of the lung tissue that uh, it's frozen around the tip is uh, pulled out by a shearing force okay, by this, this method we get a larger specimen compared to the endoscopic biopsies now coming to the infectious diseases most commonly what we get are the bacterial diseases the they can be acute or they can be chronic they can also they can also be fungal diseases parasitic diseases and viral diseases now covid 19 you know one of the most common uh, uh, pneumon cause of pneumonia in nowadays and fungal diseases one should always suspect fungal diseases uh, in immunocompromised patients so let's start with the acute bacterial lung, lung infections now bacterial infections are a common cause of lung morbidity and mortality transbronchial biopsies are often used as an effective means for making a specific diagnosis particularly in immunosuppressed patients now common bacterial pneumonias are found in various clinical settings both community acquired and nosocomial community acquired means that pneumonia is occurring in a patient who is other who was otherwise healthy and the infection is acquired from the normal surroundings from the environment around him while nosocomial means that the infection is acquired from a hospital setting so uh, usually the upper respiratory tract infection maybe which is usually a viral infection it leads to a bacterial infection in the lungs so th there are two major types of uh, pneumonia according to the part of the lung that is involved one is the lobe pneumonia in which the consolidation of an entire lobe or most of the lobe uh, 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 most of the single lobe is affected and it results from diffuse and uniform inflammation of the pulmonary parenchyma and the other type of affection is the bronchopneumonia in which multiple foci of inflammation are present involving the terminal airways so here let me pointer yeah so here you can see you can see multiple affection patchy affection of the lung in one or two lobes so this is how a bronchopneumonia looks like while the entire lobe is affected in case of lower pneumonia but one should remember that any single organism can cause both bronchopneumonia or lower pneumonia and in a, a single patient can show both features of bronchopneumonia and lower pneumonia so the conditions may overlap and the same organism can cause both that depends upon various factors including the host factors now coming on to the lower pneumonia there are four stages of inflammatory response the first stage is that of a congestion which lasts for uh, one day around one day the second is a red hepatization the third is a gray hepatization and the fourth is the resolution so in congestion in the phase of congestion the lung appears heavy red and boggy there is vascular if you see under the microscope there is vascular engorgement and there is intra alveolar fluid with few neutrophils and they are teeming with numerous bacteria but after one day that is on the second and the third day what happens is the it develops red hepatization the lung becomes red firm and airless it looks like a liver so we call it hepatization 
and under the microscope we can see massive confluent exudation there is fluid along with the neutrophils rbc's fibrin they all fill the alveolar spaces and this this presence of rbc's give them the red look so we call it red hepatization while in the gray hepatization after 2 to 3 days what happens the lung is uniformly consolidated and looks grayish brown it looks just like a liver so it is uniformly consolidated the rbc's disintegrate and only the fibrino suppurative exuded they persist and the fourth phase is that of resolution the exuded of the alveolar space is broken down by enzymatic digestion and the into a granular semi fluid debris which is either expectorated out or they are ingested by macrophages or they are organized by fibroblasts i would want to remember that if there is pleural affection the pleural fibrous reaction usually leave a fibrous thickening or a permanent attesion so again bronchopneumonia you can see there the involvement is patchy that can involve one lobe or it can be multi lobe or even bilateral or basal so grossly we get slightly elevated dry granular gray red to yellow areas of consolidation so the word consolidation basically means solidification and under the microscope histologically we get the neutrophil rich exuded filling the bronchi the bronchioles and the adjacent alveolar spaces in case of bronchopneumonia now the complications of uh, this bacterial pneumonia include a tissue destruction and abscess formation this abscess formation is pretty common in case of type 3 pneumococci or klebsiella pneumonia the infection can extend to the pleura and result in intrapleural fibrino suppurative reaction which is known as empyema or there can be bacteremic dissemination dissemination to heart valves pericardium brain kidneys spleens or joints so the clinical features usually depend upon the stage at which the patient is presenting so they usually present with abrupt onset high fever with shaking chills cough with mucopurulent sputum and occasionally hemoptysis may be there if the pleura is affected there can be pleuritic pain and pleural friction rub and the symptoms relating to dissemination at a later stage like metastatic metastatic abscesses endocarditis meningitis or suppurative arthritis now based on the etiological classification we should remember that the community acquired that that is the previously healthy individual gets affected mostly by the streptococcus pneumonia which goes by the name of pneumococcus so these are gram uh, negative uh, lancet shaped diplococci and uh, they are isolated from blood cultures isolation from blood cultures are more specific but we usually uh, detected by staining of uh, the sputum by gram stain so blood cultures though they are more specific they are less sensitive and one must remember that 20% of adults uh, have uh, can have this streptococcus pneumonia as the endogenous flora another important organism particularly in secondary pneumonias that is following viral pneumonias is the staphylococcus aureus the staphylococcus aureus pneumonia develop in children post measles or post influenza or in adults as a post influenza pneumonia they are also involved in nosocomial uh, pneumonia and in iv drug abusers and one should remember that whenever staph aureus is involved there is high incidence of lung abscess and empyema now the presence of chronic bronchitis they can be affected either by this pneumococcus or by hemophilus influenzae this hemophilus influenzae are gram negative organism which can be encapsulated encapsulated or non encapsulated the, the, the b type that is b serotype is most common which is a form of encapsulated uh, h influenzae but post vaccination uh, these encapsulated forms are becoming rarer and the non encapsulated forms are now rising in cystic fibrosis other than these two pneumo pseudomonas aeruginosa is in, uh, can be uh, very in play an instrumental role as well as in immunocompromised patients so pseudomonas aeruginosa can uh, are implicated in cystic fibrosis patients and also in immunosuppressed patients so they are the one of the most common cause of nosocomial infections as well and they are more common in neutropenic patients klebsiella pneumonia 
it is again a gram negative uh, bacteria which commonly affects debilitated and malnourished people particularly in chronic alcoholics so in chronic alcoholics if a uh, a patient develops pneumonia and expectorates thick mucoid often blood tinged sputum one should uh, think about this klebsiella pneumonia so pneumonia can also occur due to certain atypical organisms like mycoplasma pneumonia chlamydophila pneumonia and others so here you can see the histological picture these are the alveolar spaces they are filled up with pus cells that is neutrophils along with there many rbcs here some organization is occurring the fibrinous exudate is there and here these proliferation proliferating fibroblasts are enmeshed in myxoid matrix so this is taking the form of an organized pneumonia So these types of pneumonia are generally diagnosed by cultures or, or, or gram stain of sputum or other respiratory secretions, and they generally do not require a biopsy unless specific culture or sensitivity assays are unsuccessful or sputum samples. Lung abscess. Lung abscess can develop following an aspiration, uh, that is aspiration pneumonia, following an infection, septic embolism, neoplasia, or some other conditions. so what happens there is extensive destruction and this whole cavity is filled up by pus cells so pulmonary abscesses they are more common on the right side when it is due to aspiration because the right side bronchus is more straight than the left side bronchus in pneumonia or bronchiectasis the lung abscesses are usually multiple basal and diffusely scattered and septic emboli and pyemic abscesses are multiple again and may affect any region of the lung the isolated organisms include aerobic and anaerobic streptococci staph aureus and a host of gram negative organisms and mixed infections can also occur particularly in aspiration type so there are some uncommon bacterial pneumonias as well so this uh, include the legionella the legionnaire's disease the nocardia actinomyces tularemia yersinia and bilioidosis so i will not go into the details of each so first of all let us talk about the legionella pneumonia or the legionnaire's disease these are caused by the inhalation of aerosolized droplets in contaminated air handling equipments like air conditioners humidifiers respiratory therapy equipments so the organism is the legionella pneumophilia which are gram negative bacteria and histologically what we get are the neutrophilic pneumonia these neutrophilic pneumonia is admixed with fibrin and nuclear debris so this gives a dusty appearance and if we uh, stain this with uh, silver stains either the ditterly or the warden study or stainer stain and the new stain this is the jivenes stain this is very good so we can demonstrate this type of bacteria we have other methods like immunofluorescence and uh, dna in situ or pcr for diagnosing the difficult cases in nocardia also we get necrotizing neutrophilic pneumonia and they occur usually in adult men who are immunocompromised and one should remember that nocardia pneumonia in nocardia pneumonia cavitation is very common and they can involve uh, the pleura uh, <coughs> they can involve the pleura and can develop fistulas and empyema so thin beaded filamentous bacteria can be demonstrated in gms staining one should remember that these nocardia organisms are weak acid fast so by fight faraco stain they can be demonstrated this weak acid fastness can be demonstrated they by this uh, fight faraco stain so these are gram positive long beaded and branching filamentous bacteria just like nocardia it can sometimes be confused with actinomyces though actinomyces we get the characteristic sulfur granules which splendor hippelief phenomena so this is known as the splendor hippelief phenomena where is amorphous peripheral eosinophilic layer so again actinomyces <coughs> it caused by mostly by actinomyces israeli and they are anaerobic thin filamentous bacteria and what we get under the microscope is the saturative inflammation with abscess formation and sulfur granules 
So the tissue gram stains, there are some tissue gram stains like brown and vein or brown and hops. So by brown and vein, we can demonstrate this as well as in by GMS. So GMS and BNB, we can demonstrate this actinoisis, but one should remember that compared to, uh, in contrast to nocardia, actinomyces is anaerobic and it is not acid fast. Now, look at this picture. This, this looks similar to actinomyces, isn't it? So, this is basically known as botryomycosis. Botryomycosis are basically bacterial colonies which resemble the sulfur granules and they also can show this splendor hippoly phenomenon. And the bacteria involved are often of mixed species, but staph aureus is common. Others include Pseudomonas, E. coli, Protea, Streptococcus, and anaerobes such as Bacteroides or Peptostreptococcus. But this tissue gram stain, BNB stain, will show masses of non filamentous bacteria, and this will help us to differentiate it from actinomyces. Now, malacoplakia, we all know that malacoplakia usually <coughs> affects the genitourinary organs and uh, these malacoplakia, they, uh, they result from uh, defective phagocytic or uh, degradative function of the uh, histiocytes. So, malacoplakia means, malacos means uh, soft and plakia means plak. So, we have to get a soft plaques in the bladder, but malacoplakia can also present in the lung biopsies. So, what we get are histiocytes admixed with plasma cells and uh, Michele Goodman's bodies. But the uh, one thing you should remember that malacoplakia has got three stages. Number one stage is the inflammatory stage. Number two is the classic stage where we get these MG bodies. And number three is the fibrotic stage. So, these Michele Goodman bodies, they are, you can see these targetoid bodies. These are basically concentrically layered basophilic inclusions, 2 to 10 microns, and represent the remnants of phagosomes mineralized by iron and calcium deposits. So, since they contain calcium, they can be stained by Boncosa or by alizarin red stain. Similar to malacoplakia, again in Whipple's disease, we can get this type of histiocytes. So, sheets of vacuolated histiocytes with bubbly cytoplasm. One should differentiate it for the mycobacterium avium intracellular infection. We will come to it later also. So, we can get sheets of vacuolated histiocytes, but they there's plenty of PAS positive intracellular granules. They can be demonstrated by PAS and they are negative for weak acid fast stain that is the fight farago. So, which differentiates them from the <coughs> MAI complex, MAI or MNC. So, the confirmation of the diagnosis can be done by PCR as well. Now, coming on to the chronic type of pneumonia. So, these usually present with acute type of pneumonia. Now, mycobacterial pneumonias are chronic type of pneumonias. The most common offenders are the mycobacterium tuberculosis or the mycobacterium avium intracellular complex or the MAI or MSE. All mycobacteria share in common, they are acid fast staining property caused by the acid content of the bacilli. So, they, if they don't stain easily with the regular stains. We have to heat carbon friction and then so that they can enter the uh, this uh, high lipid content of the bacilli, this uh, layer, mycolic acid layer. And again, we have to decolorize it by this hydro, uh, by hydrogen, uh, by H2SO4. So, the most cases are diagnosed clinically by skin tests, cultures or other laboratory tests. But in solitary lung nodule or miliary lesions may be biopsied or resected owing to preoperative concern for malignancies. For suspicion of malignancies, these lesions can be biopsied. So, the mycobacteria that causes tuberculosis in humans include the mycobacteria tuberculosis, which is the major pathogen, mycobacterial bovis, which is now, now much rare, mycobacterium africanum, which has properties in between uh, tuberculosis and bovis, and mycobacterium microti, which commonly affects the voles used and they are used mainly for vaccines. So, they, these four together, uh, they constitute the tuberculosis complex. They spread by droplets. And nowadays, it's uh, with co-infection of HIV, the incidence as well as the prevalence are increasing. And there is emergence of the multi-drug resistant tuberculosis 
or the extremely drug resistant tuberculosis. So mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, the infection pattern follows one of the two. Uh, either it's a primary infection, which was previously known as childhood TB. A primary infection means that infection is occurring for the first time. So uh, usually it occurs in childhood in endemic areas, but it can affect adults in non-endemic areas. So better, uh, it's better to call it primary infection. So one is the primary infection and the other one is secondary or the post-primary or the adult type of tuberculosis. So the primary infection may resolve or they may progress to progressive primary tuberculosis or they may become quiescent and later they can get reactivated to form a, to give rise to post-primary tuberculosis or reinfection can also result in post-primary tuberculosis. So the most characteristic lesion of primary tuberculosis is the cons focus. So the con focus, it's a subplural focus of caseous necrosis and its involvement with the uh, regional lymph node as well as the lymph vessels, they together known as the primary complex of the con complex. And when they are uh, fibrosed and calcified, we call them the Ranke complex. So uh, as mentioned, they can be resolved, they can be repaired, or they can become quiescent, or they can become, they can progress. So the progression may involve a plural involvement, or there may be airway dissemination resulting in bronchopneumonia or laryngeal lesions. There can be epituberculosis, where or the segmental tuberculosis. Now, epituberculosis means uh, suppose uh, there is a hilar lymph node, so it is enlarges, and then caseous necrosis occurs, and then it erodes through a bronchus resulting in uh, atelectasis or so collapse consolidation and uh, th that part that segment is involved by tuberculosis and we call that epituberculosis or segmental tuberculosis or they can spread hematogenously by mil by miliary tuberculosis we all know miliary tuberculosis millet seed like uh, deposits throughout the body they can result in tubercular meningitis they can be lodged in kidneys or in lung abscess because there is high ventilation perfusion ratio. So what is Simon focus? Simon focus is a tubercular nodule in the lung apex spreading by bloodstream from tuberculosis in some place else. So a tubercular nodule in a lung apex part of the primary tuberculosis is known as a Simon focus. And the most characteristic lesion of post-primary or secondary tuberculosis is the fibrocaceous apical cavitation. So the, we get a cavity in the apex of uh, the, of the lung. This results in the sloughing out of the, of the caseous material and there is fibrosis around. So this fibrocaceous apical cavitation is the most characteristic lesion of post-primary tuberculosis. This again can resolve or they can present or they can progress. Though one should remember this progression of uh, post-primary tuberculosis is much less compared to the primary. So mostly there are there is a local extension, the pleura may be involved and there can be a dissemination or hematogenous spread. Now some uh, lesions you may uh, remember, one is the asthma focus which is an infraclavicular lesion and the pulse lesions which is the lung apex and the supraclavicular in location. So these lesions are lesions within the lung and they are part of the secondary tuberculosis. And miliary primary tuberculous lesions include rig focus, figures focus and Simon's focus but it's very difficult to uh, remember this. Now non-reactive tuberculosis. Non-reactive tuberculosis occurs in immunocompromised or elderly we commonly, we commonly uh, encounter this type of non-reactive tuberculosis in immunocompromised you know, HIV patients where there is extensive caseation but we do not get any granuloma or uh, giant cells around the <coughs> So only caseous necrosis we get in case of non-reactive tuberculosis. So here you can see the fibrocaceous cavitation in the lung apex which is part of the post-primary tuberculosis. So we all know this is the characteristic picture of KZS necrosis with palisading histiocytes, Langhans type giant cells, which are multinuclear giant cells surrounding this necrotic center. So uh, it's very difficult and tedious to search for acid fast bacilli in tissue sections, but uh, you should always try to look within the KZS necrosis. 
So though it's painstaking, other methods like fluorescent staining, immunohistochemistry and PCR methods, they can be employed for detection of tuberculosis. So again, you can see this miliary pattern, multiple, multiple affection, multiple granulomas and Langhans giant cells in patients with tuberculosis. There is granulomatous, you can see these granulomas and giant cells around the bronchiole. So granulomatous peribronchiolitis, small granulomas and giant cells surrounded by abundant lymphoid, lymphocytes. So there are lymphoid follicles, lymphoid infiltrates along with these granulomas and giant cells. Now, atypical mycobacteria, these are non-tuberculous bacteria. They constitute a group of organisms that are found in soil, plants, fresh, uh, fresh or salt water and uh, animals. So they cause infection directly from the environment rather than through human transmission. But they do not follow the same pattern of primary or secondary or reactivation infections. And one should also remember that atypical mycobacteria also cause cavitary lung diseases. Now the MAC or the MAI is the most important atypical mycobacterial agent that is Mycobacterium avium intracellular complex uh, with high incidence in patients with AIDS. So there are other mycobacteria as well but MAC or MAI is the most important atypical mycobacterium. So, you can, you can get non-necrotizing epithelioid granulomas, you can see no necrosis is there, so it may resemble a sarcoid granuloma. Or there can be abundant epithelioid histiocytes admixed with other inflammatory elements in the interstitium. And if you look carefully, you can get these pseudogotcher cells. So, pseudogotcher cells, one, you should be, uh, you should be uh, very much alert to stain these for demonstration of mycobacteria. And these MAI or the atypical mycobacteria as already mentioned, they cause upper low cavitary lung lesions. So if you do a fight faraco stain, we can get abundant atypical mycobacteria and usually they are much larger than the normal, that is the mycobacterium tuberculosis. So the typical atypical ones are much larger, larger and more abundant than the typical mycobacteria. So they are easily visualized in the ZN stains and usually more slender and more abundant than in TB, particularly in AIDS patients. So we can also do the PAS and GMS stain and already mentioned the pipe caraco stain. Another unusual appearance that can occur in MAC is the uh, myobacterial spindle cell pseudotumor in which the histiocytes they take a spindled appearance and with fascicular growth pattern which resembles a mesenchymal lesion. So this mycobacterial spindle cell tumor should also be taken into account if we are dealing with MAC. Now fungal pneumonias, one should have a very high index of suspicion in for fungal in, uh, pneumonias in cases when we are dealing with immunocompromised patients. Now they can manifest as organizing pneumonia which may lead to mycetoma that is they are uh, separated by a fibrous boundary from the normal lung. So they can be limited to a mycetoma and remain in a steady state or they can progress to chronic necrotizing mycosis. And with some fungus like mucormycosis uh, can take a very life threatening course particularly now we are all aware that post covid mucormycosis is very important nowadays and uh, unfortunately we lost one of our teachers uh, by this uh, post-covid mycosis. So uh, one should remember that these fungus can take angio-invasive course or they may have other types of presentations like allergic bronchopulmonary mycosis. So these are the fungal pneumonias. So these are the type of uh, uh, fungus, the tissue reactions, how we can demonstrate and whether they are effect, they are affecting the children or adult. <coughs> so let us uh, speak about the more common ones because you can't really memorize these things like this. So first of all, let's come to the histoplasma. So here you can see a granuloma. So, with there is peripheral palisading of histiocytes. So, the histoplasma, uh, 
we get the histiocytic lesions that are filled with organisms in the acute form or in the chronic form we get the necrotizing or non-necrotizing granulomas. So either the granulomas are necrotizing like a tuberculosis or they can be non-necrotizing. But we should look for uniform round oval refractive structures within the giant cells with narrow based budding. So we can see some of the giant cells with which within which there are certain organisms, they look very uniform. They are 2 to 4 micron in size and they are round to oval cyst and these are highlighted by the GMS10 you can see these are there is a narrow based body and all these are more or less of similar size. So this feature is very important for distinguishing histoplasma from other fungus like cryptococcus. So we get uniform round to oval refractive structures within giant cells and when we stain by GMS we can highlight this narrow based body. So they are also positive for silver stain and PA stain. Uh, but they are negative for gram stain and mucicarbon stain. So in cryptococcus, again we can get suppurative inflammation in acute infections or in chronic infections we can get necrotizing or non-necrotizing granulomas just like histoplasma. So here in an immunocompetent host we get a granulomatous condition but in immunocompromised there is more mucoid appearance and the inflammation is much less but if you look carefully there are several organisms in this picture in this lung biopsy but the inflammation is sparse and overall there is a mucoid appearance if you look at it closely you can get single narrow based budding and a distinct halo so they contain a halo around them so this cryptococcus, they are, they uh, contain a halo and there is variation in size. In histoplasma, I told that they are, they are more or less uniform in size. But there are, you can see, this is highlighted by mucicarmine. So there is variation in size, there is narrow based budding. And this halo or this, uh, this halo or this uh, capsule, this can be, this, uh, uh, this can be highlighted by this mucicarmine stain which is negative in case of histoplasma. But the problem occurs in capsule deficient forms. In immunocompromised patients there can be capsule deficient forms and they do, do not uh, stain with mucicarmine those capsule deficient forms. For, the, for those cases we have to go for IHCs or for cultures. Now blastomycosis, blastomycosis, so B for B, blastomycosis, we get uh, broad based buds. So here you can see, this is an endogranchial biopsy and these are yeasts, round yeasts, surrounded by thick refractile wall with double contours. You can see the double contours here and occasionally single broad based budding. Here inside the giant cells you can see these round cysts. So, by various silver stains, we can stain them or by PA stain, we can highlight these broad based body. So, blastomycosis shows they are round structures, they are quite big, uh, 8 to 15 microns and they show this broad based body which can be highlighted by PA stain or by other silver stains. Candidiasis is dangerous because they usually affect immunocompromised patients and there is angioinvasive disease with necrotizing acute bronchopneumonia and abscess formation and they can occasionally be present only intravascularly. So here you can see a small artery. So this is an artery. It is filled with numerous fungal organisms. So this is to highlight that these are uh, angioinvasive organisms and they usually show yeasts, yeasts are the round forms of fungus and also pseudohyphae. So pseudohyphae and hyphae, how to differentiate between pseudohyphae and hyphae? Now in hyphae, they are tubular structures but there are no constrictions in them. While in pseudohyphae, you get constrictions at the point and the septum that are present, they are also not regular in case of pseudohyphae. While in uh, uh, hyphae, we get these septa at regular intervals and there is no constriction around the septa. So candidiasis usually show yeasts as well as 
pseudo height and when uh, gms10 is done they can show the small narrow budding is and the culture of this patient ultimately grew candida species so culture is very uh, diagnostic of candidiasis then occhioidomycosis again we can get a granulomatous reaction with giant cells and if you look closely there are certain organisms here and a closer look you can see these spherules these round spherules are there and these spherules they contain endospores so presence of spherules with endospores one should think of occhioidomycosis <coughs> and they are usually big 30 to 100 micrometer uh, the problem occurs when there are spherules without endospores and they may be confused for the uh, blastomyces organisms so again they can be highlighted with pa stain you can see the endospores as well as the spherules now the paracochidioidomycosis these are large is with multiple budding so previously we were talking about single budding here we get multiple budding and they resemble the mariners or the ships will and the lungs are the primary site of infection but they become systemic in 60% of the case they may mimic tuberculosis and sarcoidosis now another important organism is the aspergillus so aspergillosis <coughs> may colonize aspergillus may colonize a pre existing cavity form a fungus ball or aspergilloma they can cause high per sensitivity reactions like hyper sensitivity pneumonitis cbp they can form chronic necrotizing aspergillosis or acute invasive aspergillosis so here you can see a squamous metaplasia as well as this elongated septi septet hyphae so these hyphae are regular they uh, the septa are present at regular intervals and there is no constriction that is they are not pseudo hyphae and they usually branch at 45 degree angle but degenerative changes can cause swelling of this hyphae so when degenerative changes uh, causes swelling of aspergillus sometimes it becomes difficult to differentiate it from the mucor mucor organisms so if fruiting bodies are present they are very helpful so you can see these septet hyphae they are branching at 45 degree angle right the regular hyphae and they are highlighted by the silver stains so if these fruiting bodies are present we can give the diagnosis of aspergillosis with much confidence so just like uh, <clears throat> aspergillosis we can also at mucormycosis these you can see this uh, broad thin walled hyphae you can see the broad thin walled hyphae which are twisted and folded so they are much broader compared to the aspergillus and you can see the branching is at right angles so in aspergillus we have 45 degree branching while in mucor we have irregular branching and when whenever they are branching they are branching at right angles so there are twisted forms and they are often mixed with uh, this neutrophilic infiltrate so these are caused by the zygomatous group which includes the apsidia mucor rhizomucor or rhizopus they are gms positive they are pas densely mesophilic the best is culture and ihc so the broad thin walled hyphae twisted or folded irregularly branching at right angles now they can also contain septic but if the septic septa are present they are few or inconspicuous here you can see septa but whenever you are seeing septa don't think don't directly jump to the diagnosis of aspergillosis because we are seeing septa so you have to take all the things under consideration now pneumocystis urovesi so pneumocystis urovesi this was previously known as pneumocystis uh, carinae but pneumocystis carinae is now that the term is used for those pneumocystis infection that occurs in rats while the human form is now known by this name so here in an aids patient with pneumocystis urovesi pneumonia you can see the eosinophilic exudates it's a filling defect alveolar filling it looks 
It's like an alveolar filling defect, doesn't it? So there's higher magnification of the lung biopsy. You can see these granular eosinophilic exudates. These are filling the alveolar lumens. So they are more commonly seen in HIV patients or any immunocompromised patients. Now the silver stain, if the GMS stain, when it is done, so you can see the cysts with this prominent centrally placed dark staining dots. So these dots are very characteristic. However, they may collapse, they may, they may be collapsed or crescent shaped forms. But whenever these uh, round to oval cysts with central dots are present, the diagnosis is very easy. Now immunoperoxidase uh, stain again can be done with antibodies against this pneumocystis. So in a patient of HIV or in immunocompromised patients having atypical features, having pneumonia, one should always consider this diagnosis. Now parasitic infections are very rare, they are almost never encountered in lung biopsies and they usually systemic part of the systemic dissemination in immunocompromised patients. And many parasites they migrate through the lung during the course of their life and elicit intense inflammatory response with neutrophils, eosinophils, lymphocytes and plasma cells and this type of lung injury, they can take various patterns of lung injury. So the common parasites among the protozoa, we get the amoebiosis. In HIV patients, we get this microsporidiosis, cryptosporidiosis, toxoplasmosis mostly in immunocompromised patients. Among the nematodes, dirofiliasis, filariasis, strongyloidosis. And among the trematodes, we get cystosomiasis, paragonimiasis, or among the cystodes, we get echinococcosis. So coming on to the amoebiosis, these are quite common amoebiasis in our country and these are caused by entamoeba histolytica. So what we get are the pulmonary abscess and these organisms they look very uh, much like the macrophages. So one should uh, have a high index of suspicion. These are large tropocytes with sharply defined membranes but if we can demonstrate erythrophagocytosis, that is RBCs, if they are present, here you can see RBCs. If RBCs are present, this erythrophagocytosis clinches the diagnosis of amoebiasis. And PAS10 can also highlight the trophocytes. So they, the nucleus is smaller, but the size is larger than the macrophages. In case of uh, diophilidiasis, which is a disease caused by the parasite of dogs and other animals, diophilidae imitis or dug heartworm, it is called transmitted by mosquitoes which inject the larva into the skin. So particularly what is uh, seen in most of the cases is a sharply outlined lung infarct with peripheral fibrosis and inside the infarct one can see this type of dietophilidae infestation. So how do they look? So within the necrotic or the hemorrhagic uh, milieu in the, uh, we can see this smooth cuticle and with prominent, they are densely eosinophilic. So, the smooth cuticle with prominent external striations. In filariasis, this is the characteristic feature. They are caused by Usheria bancrofti, Brugia malai, and Oncosarco colvulus. That is, the lung infections are mainly caused by these three. And the patient may present with eosinophilic pneumonia or a pulmonary nodule. So, the worms show tight coils, multiple cross sections may be present and they are surrounded by a thin, finely striated cuticle. So, dirofiliria has a thick uh, cuticle while in filariasis we get thin, finely striated cuticle. In strongyloidis, larval infection, S-shaped filiform larva can be seen within the alveolar spaces while this uh, paragonimiasis this is rare in our country but this is caused by oriental lung fluke, paragonimus uh, westermanni, which is acquired by eating raw or undercooked crabs or crayfish, is most commonly in uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, here you can see the cysts of paragonimus westermanni, oval eggs with thick bifurifringent shell, which is surrounded by this granulomatous fibrosing reaction. So this bifurifringent shell is very characteristic. While in cystosomiasis, we can have this birefringent capsule and a short lateral spine. So the eggs of Cystosomia hematobium can uh, have a terminal spine while those of Mansani has a lateral, large lateral spine and this short lateral spine is seen in, strep, uh, in Cystosoma japonica. So these are the caused by tropical flukes 
that is the cystosome and sony japonicum and hematopium echinococcus these are uh, much more common so uh, the, also known as the hydatid disease or hydatidosis it's an infection of the lung caused by the larval tip forms echinococcus granulosus echinococcus multilocularis or mokeli so the dog or sheep strain of echinococcus granulosus is the most common uh, in biopsy what we get usually we do not get all these features we usually get this type of thick uh, hyaline appearance of the cyst wall and sometimes this laminated germinal layer and if we are lucky we can get this brood capsule containing the, uh, the this brood capsules containing the protoscolysis and the booklets Now the viral pneumonias in fact the lower respiratory tract so they can they can be seen in three settings the infections confined to the respiratory tract part of the systemic infections that involve the lung or opportunistic infection of the lung in the immunocompromised so again for diagnosis of uh, so normal host para influenza respiratory rsv para influenza influenza adenovirus are very important while secondary to systemic infection post measles or uh, uh, adenovirus or varicella zoster they can lead to viral pneumonias while in immunocompromised host cytomegalovirus hsv varicella zoster or adenovirus are the common offenders now the most common pattern of lung injury owing to virus is that so diffuse alveolar damage whenever you see diffuse alveolar damage is not a diagnosis diffuse alveolar damage is a pattern so it's a pattern of injury so you have to look for why this dad is occurring so in case of a viral pneumonia is resulting in dad you have to look for the viral cytopathic effects these cytopathic effects are mostly the intranuclear or the cytoplasmic inclusions but one should remember that certain viral infections like hanta virus influenza virus or the sars corona virus or the covid 19 sars cov 2 they do not produce any inclusion that are discernible on routine examination so this is a list of the various cytopathic effects we will cover them as we see the diagrams so in cmv there can be diffuse interstitial pattern of lung involvement and this cytopathic effect this include these large uh, eosinophilic viral inclusions, intranuclear inclusions, but these inclusions can also be present in the cytoplasm. So they can be also stained with IHC, the antibodies against the CMV. In HSV or the herpes simplex virus, you can see the three M's that is the multinucleation, the margination of chromatin and the molding so these three m's and along with that you can see this type of intranuclear inclusions so they can again be highlighted with anti hsv antibodies in adenovirus there is acute necrotizing pneumonia in adenovirus extensive hemorrhage and dad that is diffuse alveolar damage and one of the characteristic features of dad you already know this is the highly membrane formation so we are getting DAD, we are getting hyaline membrane, but we should look, we should search for the cause. So here you can see these viral cytopathic effects. So you can highlight so early, uh, in early stage of infection, these round to oval, uh, eosinophilic round to oval viral inclusions with halos can be seen. While in a later stage, these inclusions become dark and smudged. So the early inclusions are dense and eosinophilic, round to oval with halos, while the later lesions show the dark and smudged inclusions in cases of adenovirus. In RSV, that is respiratory syncytial virus, so by the name it's evident that we get necrotizing bronchiolitis surrounded by syncytial giant cells. So respiratory syncytial virus, they produce a giant cell pneumonia type of reaction. So interstitial giant cell pneumonia along with necrotizing bronchiolitis. And the higher power, you can see these type of syncytial giant cells and multiple small intracytoplasmic, these red inclusions. You can see these red inclusions. So this is the feature of RSV. 
In measles, again, we get this type of giant cells, multinucleate giant cells can be seen and similar inclusions to RSV are there. And another common thing in measles pneumonia is this type of prominent squamous metaplasia in the wall of the bronchioles. So, one should also consider the history of measles. So, so this diagnosis is always multidisciplinary. The clinician, the radiologist, the pathologist, they should always work in unison to give the final diagnosis. So in H1N1 influenza, the most characteristic feature is the large hemorrhagic infarct along with DAD and necrotizing inflammatory infiltrate. But one should remember that diagnostic cytopathic effects are absent in influenza pneumonia. In SARS-CoV-2, in SARS-CoV-2, uh, we get a severe death or the acute executive phase or subacute phase or chronic fibrotic phase as well as bronchopneumonia. But most cases of SARS-CoV-2, there is COVID-19 present with acute phase of DAD with prominent hyaline membranes and edema, mild interstitial inflammation and discommoted pneumocytes. Another important feature of COVID-19 infection one should remember there is no definite viral inclusion I already mentioned but pulmonary microthrombi in small and medium sized vessels they were reported in 57% of the cases though the previous SARS had only 50 uh, they also had 58% of microthrombi so both SARS, SARS and SARS COVID-2 they can result in pulmonary microthrombi or there can be thrombosis in large pulmonary vessels in 15% cases. And in COVID-19, another important thing is secondary bacterial infections have been reported in 32% of cases. So here you can see the acute executive phase of uh, uh, DAD, subacute organizing proliferative phase, acute fibrinous and organizing pneumonia and organizing pneumonia. We will come to these uh, features later also. So basically what we are having, what we get there is disquamation of the pneumocytes, we are getting hyaline membrane and in the early cases we have pulmonary edema. So the patients are presenting with ARDS and on histology we are getting DAD that is diffuse alveolar damage. So the common pulmonary infiltrates the immunocompromised hosts we have already covered. So the common forms uh, are cytomegalovirus and various fungal and bacterial diseases. Now the inflammatory disease of lung, they are there are various patterns. They can they can be acute or subacute or chronic inflammation. So I will have to skip through some slides because uh, probably these are repetitions and you already know the various patterns of lung injury. So suppose uh, this is uh, the that or the diffuse alveolar damage have three phases. So the first phase is the exudative phase. In any case of DAD, what we get, initially there is interstitial edema fluid and there is damage to the endothelium as well as to the bronchiolar epithelium. So this is the initial phase of DAD and there is alveolar septal congestion. You can see there is septal septic shows congested, dilated congested vessels and some of the air spaces may show focal hemorrhage and fibrin. But it is very difficult to diagnose DAD at early stage without the clinical history of ARDS. In the second phase, that is the exudative phase, there is the formation of this type of this type of yes, dense eosinophilic material, these are known as the hyaline membranes. So this is characterized by acellular eosinophilic proteinaceous material along the alveolar walls. This is prominent in the exudative phase and also there is hyperplasia of the type 2 pneumocytes in the exudative phase. So some of the alveoli in the exudative phase can show features of proliferative phase as well. So the next phase is the proliferative phase where there is active fibroblastic proliferation. So there is active fibroblastic proliferation, you can see fibroblasts which are enmeshed in the loose mixoid matrix, but there is no collagen. So this is proliferative, not fibrotic phase. So this is a proliferative phase where we are getting these fibroblasts. And these fibroblasts may project from the interstitium into the alveolar spaces. 
So again, you can see this is a proliferative phase, and there is squamous metaplasia as well. So the alveolar lining is showing squamous metaplasia, and even this metaplasia can look very atypical as well. So lung biopsies may show superimposed features of all phases of DAT in a case. So this case, that is the fibro-proliferative phase, may progress to a fibrotic phase. In fibrotic phase, this uh, there is extensive collagen deposition in and around the septa, and this collagen deposition ultimately distorts and remodels the whole lung architecture and result in honeycombing of lung parenchyma. So in the fibrotic phase, the collagen deposition you can see. Inflammation is minimal, the fibroblasts are minimal, but there is deposition of collagen. And ultimately, there can be honeycombing of lung. So, this is a case of honeycombing of lung, is of acute interstitial pneumonia. So, acute interstitial pneumonia is an inflammatory condition, which is an unknown etiology occurring in healthy young adults, where the patient presents with ARDS and the histological features of DAD. You can see this hyaline membrane formation. And the, the patients usually have a very downhill course and they usually die within few weeks to a uh, few days to weeks. And if the patient survives, there can be extensive fibrosis and honeycombing in just like this patient had. So acute interstitial pneumonia or hemorrhage syndrome, it's a very deadly condition. So drugs can also cause inflammation, can also cause acute lung injury and diffuse alveolar damage. Now, basalfan can show this type of alveolar 2 pneumocytes. They become markedly enlarged and pleomorphic looking with prominent nucleoli. While in amiodarine toxicity, we get extensive vacuolation, cytoplasmic vacuolations inside the macrophages as well as the type 2 alveolar pneumocytes. So, this type of vacuolations is very characteristic of amiodarone toxicity. Acute eosinophilic pneumonia, this is again an inflammatory condition which causes acute lung injury. The patient presents with fever, but rapidly progressive uh, respiratory failure and the BAL eosinophilia is more than 25% but there is no identifiable etiology for this type of eosinophils. So, there is no infection or parasitic infestation or drug exposure. The good thing is that they, though they present in rapidly progressive respiratory failure, they also experience rapid recovery either spontaneously or with corticosteroid therapy. So, the well-formed hyaline membranes, which is a feature of DAD and presence of numerous eosinophils and neutrophils within the alveolar spaces. So, this is acute eosinophilic pneumonia. Now, the chronic lung injury, again, can take various forms. They can take the form of bronchiolitis obliterance with organizing pneumonia or boob, or they can take other forms of interstitial lung disease, features of interstitial lung disease. So now the BOOP, boob, this uh, term is now eliminated. They are better called as cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, that is COP or organizing pneumonias. So basically, again, we are uh, talking about a pattern which can be seen in, as a in chronic lung injuries. So here you can see the tissue response in a chronic lung injury. This tissue response is that of a boob or the organizing pneumonia. You notice the plugs of granulation tissue located within the lumen of these airways and extending into the alveolar ducts or alveoli. So what are these plugs composed of? These are com these comp comprise of inflammatory cells, neutrophils, macrophages, lymphocytes, as well as admixed with small vessels and fibroblasts. They are embedded in loose mixoid matrix. And these plugs may appear polypoid masses and they penetrate through the walls of the alveoli into adjacent spaces. So these plugs are also known as mason bodies. So the fibrous plugs may also completely fill the alveolar ducts, adopting a branching con configuration like this one. So these polypoid muscles or the mason bodies you can see one alveoli it is spreading to the next alveoli it is passing through the pores of cone that is the uh, uh, communication between the adjacent alveoli. So they can go through the pores of cone and affect the adjacent alveoli. And again this is a branching configuration when the fibrosis is much more this fibroblastic focus can take a branching configuration extending along 
the alveolar duct. So these are the features, these are characteristic features of COP or uh, uh, organizing pneumonia. So BOOP, they have been separated, bronchiolitis obliterans feature or organizing pneumonia feature. Now what is the bronchiolitis obliterans features? The bronchiolitis obliterans features is there is peribronchiolar fibrosis and collagenization leading to partial or total obstruction of bronchioles. So bronchiolitis obliterans, the bronchial, bronchioles get obstructed by the inflammation and peribronchial fibrosis and collagenization. So we have talked about two uh, features, this uh, bronchiolitis obliterans and we have talked about DAD, we have talked about organizing pneumonia. Now, various injuries, the, the, the chronic lung injuries can also present with features of usual interstitial pneumonia that is UIP or non-specific interstitial pneumonia that is NSIP or they can present with lymphoid or interstitial pneumonia. So this chart is basically uh, for idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. I have just used it to highlight that these are the features, these are the various patterns of interstitial pneumonia which can be seen in chronic lung inflammations. So the usual interstitial pneumonia, here you can see the fibrosis usually subpleural and paraseptal. So the most important part in UIP is the temporal heterogeneity. So here you can have normal part of lung and here you can have extremely fibrotic alveolar septa alternating with areas of normal lung parenchyma. So there is temporal heterogeneity. So this is a very important feature of UIP. So there can be marked thickening of alveolar septi as highlighted here and when this progresses there is honeycombing, this is microscopic honeycombing. So you have seen the macroscopic honeycombing in the gross uh, of the lung, so this is microscopic honeycombing resulting from intense fibrosis. Now, in cases of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a type of UIP without any cause, so they can have DAD-like features as acute exacerbations. So this UIP pattern can also be seen in chronic inflammatory conditions. Another condition is the non-specific NSIP. So NSIP pattern and UIP pattern, they should be differentiated. How? The NSIP, the NSIP is characterized by temporally uniform pattern of changes. So the inflammation is diffuse and information, uh, uniform and the fibrosis is also uniform and septal. So there is no temporal heterogeneity for uh, as in UIP. And there is no advanced fibrosis, there is no honeycombing, there is no fibroblastic foci and they have got a much better prognosis than UIP and they, as they respond well to corticosteroids. They can be cellular that is inflammation predominant or they can be fibrosing that is fibrosis predominant. Obviously the cellular NSIP has a better prognosis than the fibrosing NSIP. So here you can see inflammation. So there is thickening of and fibrosis of the alveolar septa and there is inflammation. So cellular uh, NSIP, you can see many inflammatory cells in the alveolar, in the thickened alveolar walls. Another type is the lymphoid interstitial pneumonia, pneumonia that is LIP or the diffuse lymphoid hyperplasia or the DLH. So again here you can see numerous lymphocytes. So one should, uh, you should be alert that whether we are dealing with any case of multoma, low-grade multoma. So numerous lymphocytes are there. So they are now, LIP is now included under the category of lymphoproliferative disorders. But what separates this from multoma is that the polyclonality of the lymphoid cells. So this is again, this LIP is again an, a pattern which we can see in various chronic lung injuries. So the various connective tissue diseases associated with lung injury and inflammation that is the rheumatoid arthritis where we get follicular bronchiolitis. Now follicular, what is follicular bronchiolitis is the other name of LIP. So diffuse alveolar damage, organizing pneumonia, you can see in all the connective tissue diseases we can get a constellation of uh, patterns that we have already discussed under the chronic lung injury patterns. So in rheumatoid arthritis we usually get discrete lymphoid follicles. So the pattern of uh, chronic lung injury along with lymphoid follicles and plenty of plasma cells. So whenever we are looking at lymphoid aggregates or follicles, increased number of plasma cells, perivascular collagen deposition, 
with along with features of ild we should think of uh, ctds that is connective tissue disorders the, uh, so in end stage disease of uh, rheumatoid arthritis one can get rheumatoid nodules but they are quite rare so what we get in rheumatoid arthritis we get uip nsip lip or op there is organizing pneumonia in various combinations so diagnosis is basically by uh, uh, by clinical features and by other tests so here you can see a mixture so you can see nsip and <coughs> and extreme fibrosis as nsip here you can see lip that is lymphocytic infiltrating uh, interstitial pneumonia pattern along with organizing cop or op pattern that is organizing pneumonia pattern so one can have multiple features in the same biopsy so this is a case of rheumatoid nodule where you can see the necrosis and palisading histiocytes so this is the end stage of rheumatoid arthritis in sle the patient can present with acute lupus pneumonitis that is acute lung injury pulmonary hemorrhage and vasculitis or they can present with subacute or chronic disease with nsip via cellular interstitial pneumonia with variable interstitial fibrosis so rarely uip is seen in sle so most cases we see acute lupus pneumonitis or nsip cellular nsip so you can see acute lupus pneumonitis and a cellular nsip large number of cells and thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension this is another important feature which we see in the vasculitis can be seen in all connective tissue diseases but these are more common in case of sle and here again you can see uip like fibrosis in jogren syndrome lung involvement often occurs and is characterized by lip so in jogren's we get lip predominant and the common finding is presence of small non necrotizing interstitial granulomas at mixed with lymphoid cell populations and one should uh, always be cautious because the patients of jogren syndrome have an increased risk of developing lymphoproliferative disorders so you can see the bronchial glands showing intense lymphoid aggregates and the combination of lip numerous lymphocytes as well as organizing pneumonia type features in case of in a case of jogren syndrome so clinical features as well as serological diagnosis is very important for the connective tissue disorders anti ccp is very characteristic for rheumatoid arthritis while anti ds dna for sle anti jo1 for poly and dermatomyositis anti histone for drug induced lupus anti rnp for mixed connective tissue diseases and anti ro anti la for the jogren syndrome so we already discussed about acute eosinophilic pneumonia now its chronic counterpart is there so it is known as chronic eosinophilic pneumonia so here you can see dense infiltration by eosinophils and mixed with fibroblastic focus the very typical feature is the patient presents with bilateral subpleural infiltrates which poorly defined with poorly defined margins that may disappear spontaneously or only to recur at the same sites so they are known as migratory infiltrates and there is mild interstitial pneumonia with hyperplasia of type 2 type 2 pneumocytes and accumulation of fibrin in alveolar spaces but the most characteristic feature is the presence of these type of multiple uh, numerous eosinophils dense infiltration by eosinophils along with fibrosis just like the acute counterpart is chronic eosinophilic pneumonia is also of unknown etiology so the infections of lung are common one should have a high, a high index of suspicion for fungal infections or the immunocompromised they may require lung biopsies and the effort should always be multidisciplinary morphology awareness about morphology special stains culture ihc and pcr are helpful in diagnosis and recognition of patterns of acute and chronic lung injury <laughs> is very important and it should be coordinated with clinical imaging and other laboratory parameters thank you these are the my references and thank you for your patient uh, sharing i have a short think i 15 minutes no 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 you have no <laughs>
Thank you so much. Uh, just stop sharing so that we can see you on the screen. Yeah, wonderful. Actually, you have not overshot. You have completed the entire subject in such a nice manner. As I earlier told, time is not a factor. Each and every aspect has been dealt so well. And in extreme detail, I mean, uh, when I was going through and listening to it, I, I was realizing how much effort and, you know, you have put in so much of time to put this talk together. It is going to be a very wonderful, you know, <clears throat> talk for, for all the PGs to learn. Especially with the FRC path right on the corner, you know, it will be very important for them also because all these UIPs and books and all the cryptogenic pneumonia and all these things are so important now. Chronic eosinophilic yes, pneumonia, we, we, we don't even entertain that entity, but it is very much there. And, and, you, and especially you spoke very well in detail about uh, covid which is very important and I think that is one thing which we all need to learn in much detail. And all the helminthic infection and the and particularly the, the fungal infection. I think you the, the amount of details you went through, it, it was very, very, very nicely done. Very thankful to you, Dr. Indrarin, for coming on this and, and, and presenting such a wonderful talk on the inflammatory and infective lesions of the lung. This will be remembered for long and people will go back and listen to it again and again. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank right? you, Bye -bye. Thank you. Take care then. Good night. Please share the PDF uh, so that yes, you can share with everybody. Right. Take care yes. then. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. God bless you. Bye. Thank you.